Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday Bible Life today, and Merry Christmas. It's Christmas Eve day, and uh, I've got my Christmas sweater on. Uh, long, long time ago, uh, my brother and I's mom got us matching sweaters to wear. I don't remember how many years ago that has been. Uh, she passed away in 1995, I believe. And so it's been a long time because it was quite a while before then. And I think both of our sweaters wore out and we're on second or third sweaters of the same kind. I wear mine once a year on Christmas Eve and we'll be wearing it tonight at the candlelight service at church. And so uh, hopefully my brother will remember and wear his at the same time. We started a study last week after finishing up looking at the parables of a general prophecy study. We started way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. We'll look at that again today. But since this is Christmas Eve, I thought it would be good and interesting to look at several prophecies throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that deal with the prophetical passages that speak about the Lord, uh, His first coming as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. So if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to begin again at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. From there, we'll be moving to Genesis chapter 49 and then to 2 Samuel chapter 7. So uh, I'll give you a few minutes to, to get to those places as we talk about them, if you would like to follow along. If not, you can just listen and I'll read them for you. Beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where we started last week on our general prophecy study, um, we'll get back to that chronological study of prophecy next week. But again, we'll begin at Genesis 3.15, and it says, God the Father was speaking to the serpent, or Satan, after the fall of Adam and Eve and sinned in the Garden of Eden. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that was the very first prophecy that we looked at last week in our general prophecy study about the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. And remember, we talked about that this particular verse insinuated a virgin birth because it spoke about the seed of the woman. And a woman does not have the seed. The man is the one that provides the seed. But this particular time, uh, the Holy Scripture spoke about the seed of the woman, and it insinuated a virgin birth. The next uh, passage we're going to look at is in Genesis chapter 49. This is the chapter close to the end of the book of Genesis, where Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, is gathering all of his 12 sons together and his family just prior to his passing and gave a last word of testimony, uh, exhortation, and prophecy uh, concerning the future for his descendants and each of the sons and their descendants. And in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, he said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And Shiloh there is a reference to the Messiah, to the coming uh, king of the Jews. Which at that time, um, they were uh, a long way away from that happening. And so, unto him shall be the obedience of the people. So this speaks about the Messiah coming from the tribe of Judah. In our Wednesday evening Bible studies, in the last few weeks, we've been looking at the ancient order of Melchizedek, that priestly order, and uh, comparing that to the Levitical priest order. And all of the priests of the Levitical order had to come from the tribe of Levi, and there was a separation of offices or powers, so to speak, 
the kings could not be a priest and the priests were not allowed to be kings. It was a separation of power. And the priest at that time came from Levi and the kings, according to the promise that we'll see here in a little bit, uh, through the Davidic covenant, came through the line of Judah. And here, uh, Jacob or Israel uh, was speaking prophetically about the fact that Shiloh or the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. The next uh, scripture we're going to look at is in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 25. This is a portion of scripture that is during the time of the reign of King David, and he realized that he lived in a nice home, probably a mansion in those days, comparatively speaking, to what the rest of the people lived in. And it was a permanent dwelling of cedar. And he realized and thought about the fact that God at that time resided on the earth in a tent. Now the tabernacle, the temple had not been built yet. And he had a desire to build a permanent dwelling, uh, which would be eventually be the temple. And he was told by God through the prophet Nathan that he would not be the one to build it, but that his son Solomon would build the temple. And he went on to give some uh, prophecies about David and his descendants. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 25, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, this is David speaking in appreciation and gratitude to the Lord. Establish it forever as, and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. So this was the beginning of what we recognize and know as the Davidic covenant which was a promise by God to David that the Messiah, the eventual king of the Jews, would come as his direct descendant. The next scripture we're going to look at is in Psalm 89. And it also is going to speak about this promise that God gave in the Davidic covenant to David. And Psalm 89, I believe, was written by Ethan the Ezraite, and in verses 34 through 37, we find these words. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. This is God speaking. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky, Selah. So Ethan, the Ezraite, was confirming the Davidic covenant. The next scripture that we're going to look at as a prophetic word about the Christmas time, the coming of the Messiah, comes from a familiar passage in Isaiah. We'll look at a couple of them in Isaiah that will be very familiar. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 7. And verse 14, and this is where uh, God, through the prophet Isaiah, told the Israelite king that God would provide a, a sign himself. God had sent Isaiah uh, to this northern Israel king to tell him that his enemies were not going to come and destroy him. And as a verification of that, Isaiah told this king to ask for a sign and God would provide it. And this king that he was talking to was an unrighteous king. And yet in his moment of piousness, uh, he said, I'm not going to uh, ask a sign of God. And so Isaiah said to him in verse 14 of Isaiah chapter seven, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. In the Old Testament prophecies, as we will look at when we get back on track with our chronological going through the Bible, looking at various prophecies next week, 
we will begin to see that when a prophet in the Old Testament gave a prophetical word, there would be a near-term uh, realization, and there would most of the time also be a far out into the future, far away fulfillment that would even be greater and more significant with a spiritual overtone to it. And that was the case with this particular word because Isaiah spoke this about 700 years before Christ was born. And he said that the Lord himself will give you a sign. And he gave that sign to everyone. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. <clears throat> the next one that we look at is in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This is another familiar verse or verses that oftentimes we hear uh, in the Christmas story and quoted in uh, messages that are brought about at Christmas time. Verse number six from Isaiah chapter nine. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. These two phrases of the first portion of chapter six, I've always contended believe and believe that they speak about two different times in the life of Christ here on earth in his first coming. Where it says, for unto us a child is born, refers to his birth at Bethlehem. And when it says, unto us a son is given, I believe that was fulfilled on Calvary's cross uh, when he was 33 years old. But it goes on to say, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Chronologically speaking, David lived and had his reign around 1000 BC. Isaiah had his ministry during the time of four different kings in southern Judah. And he had his time of ministry from somewhere around 730 or 40 BC until just a little less than 700 BC. And during the time of Hezekiah, he was giving some of these prophecies. And he said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is forgiven, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And that speaks about out into the millennial kingdom that Christ will set up when he comes back the next time. So that's another familiar passage. The next passage we're going to look at is in Daniel chapter 9. And we'll spend a lot of time on this particular passage when we get back to our regular uh, general prophecy study, going through the Bible from Genesis to eternity. Because, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest portions of prophetic scripture that we have anywhere in the Bible. It's a prophecy that's referred to as Daniel's 70-week prophecy. We find it in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. But this morning, I want to begin reading in verse number 20 and go just through the first portion of chapter of uh, verse 26. So it'll be Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 26a. This is Daniel giving information in that he understood by reading what Jeremiah had written that they would be in exile in Babylon for 70 years. And he realized that that 70 year period was about up. And in the ninth chapter of Daniel, he began a prayer in about verse two that went all the way through verse 19. And it was a prayer that was a beautiful prayer. A lot of times we think of Daniel in the lion's den or Daniel the prophet. Seldom do we think about Daniel the prayer warrior. And probably one of the greatest attributes of Daniel's life was his prayer life. And I would encourage you to read those verses, uh, verse 1 through 19 of Daniel chapter 9 sometime, 
because he identifies himself with the sinful people of the nation of Israel. Although none of his sins in his life were ever recorded for us in scripture, but he humbly identified himself with the sinful people of his nation and asked for God's mercy and provision. And then Gabriel came to him and gave him some prophecies. So I'll begin reading at verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come to uh, give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. And then in verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. This period of time that amounts to 490 years that God is giving prophecy to Daniel that he will have 490 years dealing directly with the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. He divided it up into three sections. There was a seven-week section and a 62-week section and a portion that we didn't read, but we will read later on in our general prophecy study, a one-week section. So what we find is that at the end of seven weeks and at the end of 62 weeks, which makes 69 weeks in total, the Messiah will be cut off. That means the Messiah will have to have come. And Daniel gave his prophecy. He went into captivity around 605 BC. And the 70 year captivity in the country of Babylon was ended around 536 BC. So it was well over 500 years before Christ that Gabriel gave this prophecy to Daniel. And Daniel recorded it, and it was written into the Old Testament scriptures, and even into the Septuagint that was a translation from Hebrew into Greek some 200 or so years prior to Christ's birth. And it prophesied that at the end of the 62nd week, the Messiah would be cut off. That meant he had to have come prior to that time. So if people would understand what the beginning of that 490 year period was, or the seven week period and then the 62 week period, the beginning of it was the decree that went out from Artaxerxes to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and its walls. From that time forward, if you count it up on a Jewish calendar, it came out to the very time when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on the donkey and that week was crucified. And so this prophecy, that's Daniel's 70 week prophecy, is the reason that some people being aware of the Old Testament prophecies were anticipating the coming of the Messiah at any time. But the majority of them were not. We find a parallel to that in the day in which you and I live, in that when we look at prophetical scriptures about Jesus' second coming and what he said in the Olivet Discourse and in other prophetical scriptures about what will be the situation on planet Earth just prior to his return, 
we see shadows of those things happening now and anticipate that his second coming is near. But in line for the Christmas season and the prophecies that deal with the Messiah's coming the first time at Jesus' birth, this particular prophecy was very important for that. The next one that we'll look at is in the last book of the Old Testament. It's in the book of Malachi. And it's going to be a prophecy about someone who would come and prepare the people and make way and get the people ready for the arrival of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, when his ministry came. In Malachi chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse number 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This prophetical verse speaks about and refers to John the Baptist, who is that one who came from the wilderness, proclaiming that the Lord was coming, that the king was coming, the kingdom was at hand. And he was the one who will come before the Messiah preparing the way. And in fact, he is the one that when Jesus began his ministry and came to where John was baptizing in the Jordan River, John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the crowd as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that was about 30 years after the birth of Christ because his earthly ministry lasted about three and a half years. The last one that we're going to look at this morning comes from Luke chapter 1. There's a couple of places in the Bible that we find the Christmas story and the genealogy of Christ. One is in Matthew, one is in Luke. And to get the whole picture of the Christmas story and everybody that's involved, you have to put both Matthew and Luke together. But we're dealing just with prophecies about the coming of the Messiah in this particular time. So we're only going to look at a passage from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. And this is when Gabriel came to tell Mary that she's going to conceive as a virgin and bring forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the sixth month, that referred to the sixth month of Elizabeth, who was a relative of uh, Mary, who was the one that would give birth to John the Baptist. And she had been pregnant with John the Baptist for six months. So it's referring to that particular time. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. That's very important because part of the Davidic covenant and the promise was that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah and specifically as a direct descendant of David. So Joseph was of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Well, this is a famous passage that we hear just about every year at Christmas time, especially in kids' programs at church. Jesus and the salvation that he provides is God's Christmas gift to you and me. In fact, to everyone who will believe in him as the Messiah, the Son of God, our Savior. We've looked at some scriptures that speak about Jesus' first coming which are celebrated at Christmas time. And if you noticed, they're all very Jewish. 
sometimes uh, we have the idea that at Christmas time, Jewish people have Hanukkah, Gentile people and the church has Christmas. And it's almost thievery because everything about Christmas could not be more Jewish. He was born to Jewish parents. He was born as a direct fulfillment of prophecy that he would come from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David, and he would inherit the throne of his father David and rule over the house of Jacob, which means Israel, forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So sometimes at Christmas time, I give a Bible study that's entitled, Christmas is Very Jewish. And everything that we've looked at about these prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah, which we understand to be Christmas, is Jewish. We have a Jewish Savior. When he returns, he will return as the King of the Jews, as well as the King of all the universe. And so that little piece of ground in the Middle East between three continents named Israel, that all of the enemies round about it want to do away with the Jewish people and have that piece of property for themselves, that will never succeed because God has said in his word that that is my land and I have given it to the descendants of Abraham forever. And when Jesus sets up his kingdom, when he returns, it will even be expanded from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River. And there will be even larger areas of land that are divided between the various 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And in the very midst of that will be that millennial uh, temple that will be there where Christ will rule and reign from the throne of David. Well, uh, it's Christmas. Uh, the Lord has come the first time, and we anticipate it might not be long until he returns the second time. I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these people who join us online. I pray that you bless them, and as much as possible in this ridiculous year of 2020. Give them a joyful and wonderful time of Christmas. Help them, help us all, to remember the reason for celebrating Christmas is the coming of our Savior, the Messiah, your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We pray that you would bless those who join us online, that you would keep them safe and in good health, Thank you so much for the promises of your word. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Well, the Bible also has lots and lots of prophecies, maybe even more prophecies and more volume of scripture dealing with his second coming than his first coming. And next week, we'll get back on track and we'll be back in that 49th chapter of Genesis again next week when during the Thursday Bible Life today, we'll pick up again our study of general prophecy from Genesis to eternity. Until then, Merry Christmas, and may the Lord bless you and yours.